go to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Lovely, lovely story. It's in verse 1, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he's gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, Today salvation is come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. How many are glad of that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Talk about lost. What is a publican? Well, it's more than a tax collector. It's more even than someone that might work for something like the IRS. Israel is an occupied country. What would you think of one of your neighbors if they said, uh, when, if we got taken over by the Russians and they came to the Russian guy and said, look, I want to volunteer to collect taxes, 40%, and anything more that I can squeeze out of them, I want to keep. And the Russians said, that's the one we're looking for. You'd hate him. Not only would you hate him for extorting you and bullying you and siding with the enemy, you, it, what a twisted person to see that as an opportunity to get rich something wrong with that person's soul. It's twisted. Did you know that's the word, meaning of the word wicked? Twisted. These Bible words are so good. It's a shame that modern day they, they move away from them. And this man's so twisted. You know, he couldn't see. He was short. And he would, why, I, I offered though, why wouldn't he want to just get in front of the crowd? Well, now I realize he probably uh, was afraid for his life. Someone put a knife in his back or something. So he might not just have been climbing that tree just to see. He might have been climbing that tree to hide. And he's way up in the tree. And Jesus is coming through town. And he's stunned that Jesus stops right at that tree, he looks up, sees him in the branches, and calls him by name. How many are glad Jesus called you by name? Yes. Jesus knows your name. Jesus loves you. And he calls you by name. Zacchaeus! Hurry up and come down. I'm coming to your house today. Now when the crowd murmured and said, this is a sinner, they're not using that word the way we use it. Their use of the word sinner is a technical word. Their sinners is a category of people that cannot worship in the synagogue, cannot be saved, cannot be redeemed. They are just stuck. They're damned. These are the damned. And they couldn't believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, would stop at the, and go into the house of one of the damned. This man's a sinner. And right away, as they murmur, Zacchaeus stands up with a whole different attitude than the one he had before. He made a public announcement not a private announcement. Everyone that I've cheated, I want you to know. By the way, in the ancient world, nothing was private. If you had a guest at your house, everyone in the village gathered around the doors and windows to watch. How many times we read a story in the Bible where everyone's standing there looking at who Jesus is eating with? You don't have a private thing where you just have a person at your table. The whole village comes out. Well, we got to see this. And they're watching. And the man stands up in front of the whole village. Everyone I've cheated. I'm going on record. I'll pay you back four times as much. 
something happened to him just by sitting down to eat with Jesus. Already something happened to his soul. He went from being an extortioner to being a giver. He went from being selfish to having integrity and wanting to be selfless. And Jesus said something interesting to him. Today, salvation has come to this house. Salvation. He didn't say, I came to this house. He said, salvation is here. Okay. And then he went on to say, and this is the punchline, this is the line that God gave me. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. You weren't looking for Jesus. Did you know that? He was looking for you. You weren't seeking him. I wasn't seeking him. We tell ourselves lies. Well, I was an earnest, sincere seeker. Uh, there's no such thing, according to the Bible. Well, there's a lot of self-deceived people, but there's no earnest, sincere seekers because the Bible says there's none that seeketh after God. They've all gone out of the way. Even the religious thing that people get into, if it's not Christ, it's just a way to avoid God. It's a way to get away from God. All these fake religions and demonic religions are just people in flight from God, and they have to fight a religion to justify themselves. There are no seekers of God until God seeks you. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. He came right to the foot of the tree and looked right up through the leafy branches. And Zacchaeus thought he was going to do a private thing there. And he says, Zacchaeus, you come down from there. Love that little song. I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus jumped out of the tree. Town scandalized him. Well, look at the word lost. Lost. This is another one of those old-fashioned words that's so full of power. It's like the corruption of language is a big deal here. And even some churches, in order to be relevant and modern, try to get away from those old-fashioned words that are so freighted with uh, right or wrong or accusation or guilt or innocence, like... No one's a uh, drunkard anymore. Everyone's an alcoholic. And no one is an, a lecher or a fornicator or an adulterer. They got sex addicts now. And nobody is anything what the Bible says. They're never anything but the Bible says. No one's lost anymore. They're just seekers. They're just seekers. So they have secret churches. But the, when the Bible talks about sinners, one of the most frequent words it uses, lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Man, that's been coming home to me so strongly. You see so many people so lost. I watch the films from uh, Carolina, the riots, and it's people of every hue and color and race, and, they're, and they feel that they're part of a righteous cause. And when you, when you feel that you're part of something righteous. And if it isn't righteous, you, you become dangerous. You see what I'm saying? Muslims feel they're doing the right thing when they blow up people. These kids down there felt they were part of a righteous cause. They beat people randomly on the street. It's unbelievable. But they feel they're doing right. They're, that's lost. That's being lost. What does that mean? To be lost is to be so far away from where you're supposed to be. To be lost is to be so out there, so far away from what you were intended to be. Now Luke will go on to tell the, uh, this great chapter in Luke, Luke 15. Would you turn there? This is fantastic. Now I'm not going to go into great depth on it, but basically it's all about what it means to be lost and what God does about it. Luke 15, verse 4, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost, and he finds it? 
And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. I found my sheep which was lost. Well, to be lost, if people are likened unto sheep by their God, then to be lost is to be in great danger. There is no more defenseless animal than a sheep. So many predators, too. So many things out to take a sheep's life. The shepherd leaves the 99, goes right out after him, searches relentlessly. When he finds him, brings him home, on, and he's rejoicing. He's so happy over a sheep. Well, multiply that a million times. You know how happy the angels in heaven are when any single person is reconciled to God, when any sinner repents, when we have these baptisms here like we've been having lately, you know, you think we're happy? You think we're rejoicing? Jesus said right here in, in, in Luke 15, uh, I say to you, likewise, joy will be in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than over 99 just people who need no repentance. And then the next allegory is that like a woman with a coin you know how the Middle Eastern women would wear those coins across their forehead like that? You know, not all that's decorative. Part of that is protective. Why? Because you could get divorced so quickly, and all you have is what you have. And then you're on your own. That's how cruel it was. Remember, Jesus is always teaching them. Divorce, like you say, like you interpret it, that's not of God. You just write a bill of divorcement if you don't like your wife, if you don't like her cooking, if you don't like her looks, if you find a young... You just write a bill of divorcement and you say, Moses said we could do this! And Jesus said, from the beginning it wasn't so. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. In the ancient world, the one wore this, this, this gift from the groom's family, this dowry, so that in it, if she ever did get separated, she'd have something. <laughs> and she lost the coin in the house. And she swept and swept and swept and swept and swept. Can you imagine sweeping a house that might have dirt floors? There might be animals down in the lower floor. You're up on the top floor, the animals down below. I went to sleep in the Philippines in a house, and I woke up and looked through the cracks of the bamboo floor, and there was goats and chickens and who knows what else. Might have been a pig. <laughs> She would not stop until she found that coin. Why? See, here's what it means to be lost. You and every single human being is of value, incredible value. Don't ever let anyone tell you any different. Every human being is incredibly valuable because they're made in the image of God. I'm not here to tell you anything complicated today. In fact, in most cases, I'm just here to reinforce to you what you already know, but we must remember it. We must love people because they bear the image of God. They're precious. But the problem is if they're lost, then that value is lost. Some people, you, could, you can look at them and think, I don't see the value in that drunk. I don't see the value in that prostitute. I don't see the value in that violent gangbanger or that Muslim terrorist. It is hard to see the value. You couldn't see the value in a person just by looking at him. You could only see the value in a person by taking God's word for it. That man was made in the image of God. In the image of God, he made him. Male and female, he created him. And to the extent that people are lost, and there are different degrees of lostness, different degrees of the distortion of the image of God, different degrees of the compromise of the value that should be in that person. Okay, it's almost hard to see sometimes. You just got to go by faith and take it as God's word. Every single person is made in the image of God. But if you're lost, that value's lost. Let me tell you something that happened to Chris and I in Australia. We were in a 
little church. Most of, most of our meetings were great big meetings, but we were in Adelaide, and this is a very special church. It's in Adelaide, Australia, and it's called Street Church, and it's almost all street evangelists. And we're in this little room having a Bible study and praying together, and Chris has the idea, would someone please tell me their testimony? And a guy spoke up right away. Yes, I'd like to share my testimony. And I turned around and looked, and you know, he, he, there's something a little bit odd about the way he looked to me, but he, I could tell he loved Jesus Christ. So uh, he says, right off the bat, he didn't leave us in suspense. He said, I had a sex change operation years ago and tried to live as a woman. And our jaws just hit the ground. Here's this man who turned out to be a beautiful man of God, a man who would lay down his life for others. A man who spent the rest of his life out on the streets pleading with people to be reconciled to God. And he was so messed up. <laughs> we just couldn't believe it. Here's his story. I'm going to share his story. He said, well, I won't tell you how he got degraded. I don't know. I mean, something so bad happened that he's so confused about his gender. That's why this generation is going to really answer to God for their sins. Confusing little kids about their gender. That's God's image that they're playing around with. Well, he said he was totally involved in so much perversion it was unspeakable. And, but he had one weakness. Well, no, he had a lot of weaknesses. He was actually strong in his perversion. But he did love the, the show Star Trek. So he's surfing the web one time and sees an article about Star Trek. So he highlights it, starts to reading it. And then it led to another article about Star Trek and another article about Star Trek. But sooner or later, he begins to realize this website is Christian. A Christian evangelist has put up this website. He likes Star Trek too. And he's thinking in his mind, I'm not going to fall in. I'm not going to fall in. I'm not going to fall in. But he kept reading until he got to the Christian articles. And he began to read these Christian articles. Now listen, his soul was gripped. He was, he was drawn. They spoke to something deep inside of him that he thought was long dead. And he read and read and read, and finally he's so moved, and he began to cry. He said, i got to call the guy that runs this website. So he called him on the phone, wherever he was. I have no idea, but this man was in Australia. And the man said to him, he said, I've been through this. I've had a sex chain, uh, change operation. He said, you had the operation? He said, yes. Can I be helped? He said, no. You're damned. There is no hope for you. <laughs> that too was stunning. I didn't expect that. You know how the Bible says, I wet my pillow with my tears? <clears throat> he literally said that. He did that for the next four, year, four uh, days. He couldn't do anything else but weep and cry. He felt so lost, so gone, so far from God. But then on the fourth day, he remembered that somewhere in his boxes of things, all cartoned up, was a Bible. Someone had given him years earlier, which obviously he hadn't cracked. Well, he got up to look for the Bible. Maybe the guy was wrong. Maybe there is hope. And can you believe all the boxes? He, he opened the right one first, and the Bible was on top of the stack. And he began to read the Bible. And the gospel came to his soul, and he was born again. He's one of the most beautiful people I know. He's, 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 he's heavenly. What happened? Well, he was lost, and now he's saved. See, that's another word, saved. It's a powerful word. If you're lost, then you're lost. You don't got the value. If you're lost, you're in danger. You are in the desert like a sheep. You have no defense against the predators. <clears throat> this dude, he's going to be a eunuch for the le rest of his life because of what he did. But God's word even speaks to eunuchs and offers them a blessing. 
Isn't God good? <laughs> and finally, you know, there's the parable of the yes. All the time, brother, yes. Amen, brother. That's what, the, that's what this guy says. You go, God's good. He goes, all the time. <laughs> Boy, who knows better than him? Who loves Jesus most? The one that's forgiven most. The one that's forgiven most loves the most. And the truth is, you know, don't be deceived. Uh, there's not a person in here that's ever been better than that, that guy. Haven't we all sinned and come short of the glory of God? Nah. We were all lost. What's it mean to be lost? Well, it means to be in danger. It means to be wandering around the wilderness. You could be taken. It means to lose the value. Well, you know, if you get saved, you get the, God's, God can bring something out of people. The ugliest person, the worst person you can imagine. How about Saul? Went around killing Christians, breaking up families, arresting people, tricking people, forcing people to blaspheme. Did you know that? <laughs> you would think, man, he's damned, man. There is no hope for him. God saved him. God said, look, and Paul said, I'm the example. If God can save me, then he can save anyone. Now, one of the most beautiful people I know is Saul, Paul. Saul of Tarsus, now Paul. That is one of my best friends. I devour his writings and feel like I know him. He's a redeemed man. He's a redeemed man. And finally, in this series of parables, you know, what does it mean to be lost? Oh, it's the best parable of all, if you ask me. The prodigal son. The son goes away from the home. The son is so far out there. And there is a season where it's all great. Wow, freedom, finally out from underneath that oppression. Wow, the religion that was crammed down my throat. I am so glad to be out of that. And look at these people, so cool. So accepting, so with it. And they all look accepting until you run out of money. And then when they take everything from you possible, they leave, especially if you're in trouble. And he was so broke and so wretched. Now, you got to understand the Bible from a Jewish perspective. It'd be bad enough a person from Iowa think, you mean he wanted to eat the pig slop? He was tempted? But how about a Jew to whom pigs are disgusting, absolutely abhorrent. How far had he degraded? Hey, it could surprise you how far you can go. There's a great, there's a great saying that I think is powerful. It says, sin will take you farther than you ever planned. Sin will cost you more than you ever ever thought you'd have to pay. Sin will demand everything of you. It will take everything and then leave you in the, in the dirt while in the pit forever. What does it mean to be lost? Well, it has to do with losing your soul. Would you go to Mark chapter 8? Another scripture. And another word that doesn't get as much press these days, the soul, the soul. Mark chapter 8, and he says in verse 34, when he'd called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said to them, these are the words of the master. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's he talking to? You and me. What's he saying? Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Say no to yourself. Be willing to die and go after him. Then he says, for whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same will save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? 
Oh, this is another one. The loss of soul. You can lose your soul. And people do lose their soul all the time. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? You notice he talks in the language of merchandise, buying, selling, giving, trading, exchanging. Exchange what? Your soul. Really, you can exchange your soul. There's a great uh, lyric in a, a song uh, that I like. This is so many wasted talents that I sold. Everything you had originally, God gave you. Why do you think he gave it to you? For his glory. For his purposes. People think it's just like uh, uh, they, get, they come and they get a young girl on drugs and turn her into a prostitute. What is she doing? She's exchanging something precious for something short-term, cheap, get high. Or, or a lot of people do it for far less. They, they have immoral sex. They have fornication to be popular, to not be left out because it's part of going to the prom or it's part of being with the cool crowd or it's part of going here or there or why am I the only one without a girlfriend or a boyfriend? And they, set, they trade their soul for something cheap like that. <laughs> How are you going to get it back? And who's going to remove the stain? This is the issue here. You, you, it's every single day uh, I hope I'm making sense to you. Every single day, hundreds of transactions, great and small, take place. Where people either, you know, the Bible says in another place, buy the truth and sell it not. But what is the soul? Because this is the, gets to the core of the definition of what it means to be lost. It's not physical, it's spiritual, it's inward. And how it permeates the songs, the greatest song of all perhaps, the great anthem, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Came right out of the Bible. You were lost. Well, in order to know what being lost means, then you have to know what the soul is. The soul is often called the heart of a man, your inward man. Peter talks about the hidden man of the heart, the real you. And it's there that good or evil are formulated. It's out of there that your desires arise and cultivate. It includes uh, your, your, your love, your affection. Now, see, God gave you this, right? God's soul is so precious. It's a hidden man. How precious is the soul? Look, the body will die and decay. Well, one day it'll be resummoned again. But the soul is immortal. <laughs> Whatever you are, you'll always be. And whatever you are, you'll always be more. The soul always improves. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says, let, if, if anyone's righteous, let him be more righteous still. If anyone's wicked, let him be more wicked still. In other words, if you're, if you're if, let's say you're um, lustful. And if you don't get that taken care of, if your soul doesn't get saved from that, you're going to be lustful forever in, in increasing measure. Mm. Well, only there's going to be no fulfillment. I can't think of a better description of hell than that. Unfulfilled thirst, unfulfilled lust, a burning that can never be satisfied. You, you're going through trials right now, but because you love Jesus Christ, you're going to be patient, you're going to praise God. That patience will go on forever. You love. You used to hate. But you love. And love's better than hate. Hate's actually bad for you. But if you maintain with Jesus, abide in him, that love will grow forever. If you hate and don't get it resolved, that hate will go on forever. 
The soul always improves. Whatever you are, tomorrow you'll be more of, and the next day you'll be more of, and the next day you'll be more of, on forever. The path of the righteous is as the shining of the sun unto the perfect day. The path of the, of the wicked, just the same, only opposite. For some of us, the sun's rising. Started with a little gleamer of light. Just a little bit. It was in 77 or 78. I saw something. Jesus died as a substitute for me. Ooh, light. I couldn't see until then. I didn't know what was going on. I had religious notions all wrong, all misguided, all hopeless. All of a sudden, psh. And as I've continued with him... It just keeps getting clearer and clearer. That's the same with the wicked or those who forsake God. Those, for those who forsake God, they may have known something. But Jesus said, whoever has, more will be given. But whoever doesn't have, even what he thought he had, will be taken away. The sun goes down, the sun comes up. See, this is why I grieve for these kids I saw in these films. They're having a blast Literally, no pun intended, having a riot and feeling so righteous as they beat the tar out of a kid in a parking garage <laughs> who had nothing to do with anything. It's amazing what you can do if your soul is misguided enough. Look at the Muslims. Okay. Look at the Nazis. Well, what is your soul? It's where you, your heart understands. You know, there's this understanding, but there's a deeper understanding. The Bible says, with all you're getting, get understanding, okay? And then it says in another place in the book of Proverbs 9, by the knowledge of the holy comes understanding. See, the soul needs many things because of the fall. The, the soul has capacities that God gives it. The capacity to see spiritually. The capacity to hear. The capacity to walk. You don't have to be lame. You can walk as a Christian, right? The capacity to touch and to sense. We have all these physical, but the soul has all those too. Only in a deeper and more significant way. I just told a man this morning, a friend of mine that's a born-again Christian named Wade. Shout out to you, Wade. You, Wade, you got better sight than most people I ever met. And guess what? He's physically blind. <laughs> but man, can he see. But what would happen if you lose your soul, you lose that. Now, I start, we start out without it because of the fall. What, what is salvation but the opening of your eyes? How many times? I once was lost, but now I'm found what? Was blind. But now I see. I just couldn't see it until he opened my eyes. And I could, you could read the, I used to turn off Billy Graham every time he come on TV. I did, I couldn't hear it. But then once Jesus Christ came into my life and saved my soul, I can't hear enough scripture. I can't hear enough sermons. My family thought I was nuts. I'd come home with all these cassettes of sermons. What are you doing? You're listening to sermons? <sighs> he opened my ears. <laughs> I can feel, I can sense a recurring prayer. God, make me sensitive to you. Make me sensitive to your spirit. Make me sensitive to good and evil. When your soul is healthy, you love the right things, and you hate the right things. See, a healthy soul has to have love and hate. Not just love. You've got to have hate. This is a lot of modern Christianity's problem. They preach pablum. It's a non offensive humanistic gospel it's love but it's not the love that God describes it's humanism it's psychology and so therefore there's very little hatred of evil which is an essential component to a healthy soul you that love the Lord hate evil but that doesn't mean that we get turned into Pharisees that just means that as 
your soul gets healed as your soul gets renewed by Jesus Christ, for only he can save the soul. First thing he does to save the, a crooked, twisted, wicked soul is he reconciles us to God. Christ died for sins once and for all. What? To bring us to God. This is the beginning of life. This, it takes a while to heal the soul, though. James says, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. See, I initially got saved in the twinkling of an eye. As soon as I saw that Jesus died for me, I fell on my knees and said, Jesus, come into my heart. And he saved me. But I still got this body. So I'm waiting for the day that Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 15 where it says, you should be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this corruption must put on incorruption. How I want free of my corruption, my wrong desires, the things physically about me that are dead, decaying, corrupt, and susceptible. There's a part of me that's never very far from defection. But in one moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet shall sound, and bam, we're going to be glorified. It's the middle part that takes a long time. You get justified, you're going to be glorified, but the middle part is the salvation of your mind, your will, and your emotions. You see, the prophetic word came forth. The Lord says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. <laughs> well, he's going to elevate us. He does want us to think differently. He really does want us to change. Now, Nothing that I've said in this sermon is complicated. Salvation is not fire insurance. Salvation is a process that you come into to make you fit for eternity and for heaven and for the world of righteousness that's coming. Salvation is new creation. And he creates your spirit just instantly and he's going to change your body instantly. But your whole Christian life is a discipleship a salvaging of the soul. These wrong loves that I have, these wrong desires, these twisted thoughts, this distortion that I did to myself. And what loses the soul? Sin. There's a scripture in the Psalms. I'll just give you the reference. You can look it up yourself. But Psalm 36, 1 says... Transgression speaks to the wicked in their heart. Did you know that? Did you know that sin always talks to you in your soul before you commit to it or open up to it? That there's always a, a hidden conversation in the deepest part of your being and it comes to seduce you. Transgression speaks to the wicked in his heart. One of the things it says is, God doesn't care what you do. He doesn't even see it. Are you kidding? He's busy. He's got other things to do. He doesn't see what you're doing. He's big. You're small. So don't worry about that. That's transgression talking. You see, what, what loses the soul is the inward acceptance of sin. It's the agreement that people make. Yeah, this is justified. Yeah, this is right. My hatred is justified. No, I'm not going to forgive them. They didn't say it right. They didn't ask. They didn't grovel yet. That's transgression talking to you. Ah, this, this movie's all right. Sure, there's all kinds of lust and, and adultery being glorified, but just entertainment. See? To lose your soul, you, you begin to decay those capacities God gave you. What's the soul for? The soul is the gift of God that allows us to not be animals, but to actually fellowship with God, to actually know God, to actually worship God. When you come in here and worship, I hope you don't look at it like a song service. We're actually being restored because the soul needs to worship God. The soul needs to worship the one who is above. The soul needs a touch of the holy to be healthy. And the soul needs a lot of light to dispel the darkness. That's why we have to have services. 
Think these services are just tradition? If I didn't think Jesus Christ was here, where two or more gathered, I wouldn't even have a service. Why bother? No. Powerful transactions take place, especially if the word's rightly preached. Right, Don? Yes. Truth and light and love will heal the soul. The love of God heals us. It's just staggering to think that God could forgive us. When you know, see, I think of my dear friend, and people think, man, that'd be horrible. He was a transvestite, and he was a, he was a, actually, he was a prostitute. He was a lot of bad things that we can't, we can't even understand, we can't even fathom, and he knows it. What turned him into a man so pure, so full of the love of Jesus, so selfless now, and in a good spirit, he's happy. <laughs> he's got hope. He doesn't believe that this life is all there is. He knows where he's going. See, Jesus can save any soul. Jesus can touch anybody. But people have to be careful. They, they have to guard over their soul. See, you know one of the names of the soul in the Bible in Psalm 35 and Psalm 22, King David says, Save my darling from the lion, my soul from those who hate me. What's your darling? Well, that's the nearest and dearest part of you. The deepest part of you is your darling. What would you do with your darling? Well, you'd protect. How do you protect the soul? Well, you don't want to give in a bunch of hatred, a bunch of lust, a pack of lies. <laughs> if truth feeds the soul, lies distort the soul. It's, uh, this is a very deep thing. There are so many lost. I'm going to try and close because I feel I'm just... I mean, you, you, want, you want to know how important the soul is? The soul is more important than the body. Isn't the people that live in a house more important than the house? Well, the body is the house that God gave your soul. Isn't a man more important than the tool he's using? <laughs> this is my tools that God gave me so I can interact with this world. Jesus said, look, don't be afraid of anyone that all they can do to you is hurt your body. I'll tell you who to fear. Fear the one that has the power to cast body and soul into hell. I mean, if I got into hell and, and warning about it, you would think I was being melodramatic, but I, I can't. You can't, you can't overemphasize it. What, what does it mean to be lost? You, you lose your value forever? You're vulnerable forever? The prodigal son teaches to be lost means you're estranged from God and everything that makes life worth living forever. <laughs> Not even the least godly person on earth, as long as they're alive, really knows what it's like to be without God. Because you can take the worst person on earth and God will still give them a cool breeze on a hot day. And water will still satisfy their thirst. And in a zillion ways, the God who they hate, spurn, and reject shows them countless kindnesses and mercies like you can't believe. Nobody, until they leave this life, knows what it's like to really, really be lost. But there are so many degrees of lostness. How about if the light that's in you is dark? So much false religion. Jehovah's Witnesses, they go out and ring, they knock on doors and they feel righteous. This is what's bringing me close to God. We're doing it. No one else is doing it. We're doing it. What are they going to do when they die? Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You've got to believe that Jesus is God to go to heaven. <laughs> I could go on and on and on, couldn't I? The soul is your darling. 
It's nourished on Christ himself. A person has to be nourished. So the only good food for the soul is Christ. Like a lot of, this, a lot of what our culture offers is to the soul the equivalent of, of drinking Drano or something. It's worse than junk food. I'd say junk food is what a lot of the humanistic churches are giving. There may be some nutrition in it. But the culture is, is poisoning people. You can look at the hatred carefully nurtured in Charlotte and all over the country now. Our dear leaders, stock full of it. Twisted soul. Got to pray for them. You can look at the lust, the casual sexual, the attitude towards sex, the complete just dismissal of marriage. <laughs> They're lost. We're lost. How about the people that can sit there and eat a salad and drink wine and talk about selling body parts? How about half the country that insists that never end? Do not let that end. Do not let that end. You think you can do stuff like that and be the same that you were the day before? You can't. See, this is what people don't realize, that you don't stay the same. You become more of whatever you were yesterday. The soul never stops expanding. The soul always improves, either on good or evil. So, even in hell, it doesn't lose any capacity to think. Piercing thoughts. Conscience is much part of the soul. You know where the Bible says, in hell the worm dies not? Well, that may be that there's worms down there in hell, but worms are a metaphor for the conscience. <laughs> People take, you know, in closing, I mean, pe people go to the world. See, we've got a new discipline called psychology. Now, psychology, the word means the study of the soul. Well, I'm all for studying the soul. I think we should study the soul. I think people should be soul conscious. The problem with most of psychology, this new discipline, is the study of the soul according to atheists. But yet churches <laughs> are steeped in it. Are you telling me that modern-day atheists have got new insights on humanity that Jesus and the apostles didn't have? <laughs> so people go. But this is what the one I'll close on. The soul has uh, guides offered to it. The soul has guides. There's much guidance in the world. Okay, everything's guidance. Oprah offers guidance. Dr. Phil offers guidance. The universities offer guidance. The talking heads on TV offer guidance. There's so much guidance. And here's what scripture the Lord gave me with power this morning, right before I came up here. Leave them alone. They're blind guides leading the blind. And if a blind guide leads the blind... They all fall into the ditch. The only person that has any accurate knowledge of your soul is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is called in the book of Peter the shepherd and bishop of your soul. You know the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. All our sins and grief he bore. Who would bear your sins? What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless grief we bear. Right? All because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our burdens bear? The best friend of the soul is Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray you speak to every one of us on our own level because you are the shepherd and the bishop of our soul. You know us inside out. Take out any decay. Put the balm of Gilead on any torn parts. 
sweep out the rot, let people recognize the conversation, whether it be good or evil, that they have with their own soul. Let people regard their soul as something to preserve, as their darling. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.